Hey guys, I'm RNG Gamer. I play all my games randomly. Today I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven more games for you that I finished out of my backlog, which is at this many games. <laughs> so we're making some progress. Anyway, we got some really interesting ones. You might want to stay around to the end for this one because uh, there, there's a surprise at the end. We'll just say that. Also, if you haven't already, please subscribe, like, hit the bell notification, leave a comment. I answer like everyone I get. Thank you so much, guys. Let's dive right into these. Back when I was a teenager, I was in my local mall and I walked into a, I think it was an electronics boutique store and they had, you know, television screens up around the room and they would always like play trailers for games. Anyway, they were all playing the same trailer for this game and I was like blown away by it. Like everybody was just standing around watching this trailer because it was so amazing and we'd never seen anything like it before. And at the time, and it's, I guess it still is, it's on the Dreamcast, and at the time it was the most expensive game ever made. They have recently re-released this on the PS4 in a compilation, along with its sequel, and another sequel we never thought we were gonna get, famous game, it's Shinmu. So in Shinmu you play as Ryo, and uh, the premise is that Landi, this, I don't know, like, organized crime leader uh, murders your father and you're going to go investigate and find him and get get revenge you know the classic tales old as time Londi is looking for these mirrors that your father had and I guess they have like some sort of supernatural element to them although in Shinmu 1 you don't find out what that is yet spoilers for a game that's almost flipping 30 years old sorry guys I guess 25 years not so bad only 25 years old anyway but Shinmu is kind of unlike any real game I've ever played in my life. And I did try to play this on the Dreamcast years ago. Um, and I don't remember why I stopped. I think maybe my VMU, my memory card, like died on me or something. And I didn't have the money to get one or I didn't want to start over or something like that. But anyway, um, how do I describe this? If someone online said... Uh, uh, Shinmu is like a stop and smell the roses kind of game and that's absolutely right you basically just kind of like wander around this small Japanese town uh, and you just talk to people and you gather clues and there's a lot of side content where you can play arcade games and collect stuff and you just kind of like chit chat and explore and you get a job driving a forklift it, it, it almost feels like a game that's entirely made out of like side content that you would see in a you know, another open world game. And you wake up every morning, you know, and you just kind of like are free to do what you want to do. You just have to be home by 11 so you don't get in trouble. I guess it's almost like a life simulator. That, that's kind of how I would describe it. It's, it's a life simulator adventure game with some combat and cutscenes in it. And, or not cutscenes, quick time events. So, and you can see here, I mean, the game looks pretty good. This is on the PS4 and it's like in HD, I guess it's upscaled to 1080p or whatever. But when this game came out, like I said, it was unbelievable. And that charm still carries over to today. The music is unbelievable. And, uh, but the voice acting is like it, unbelievably miserable. Like maybe the worst in any game ever, but I, I wouldn't have it any other way. That really just adds to the charm of the game. Class just got out. You shouldn't be around here. But I was looking for you. Oh? My friend said she saw you down here. But why? Today we had our college orientation, but you weren't there. Yeah. The whole experience is set in like 1986 and that, that's like freaking awesome. Like Japan in the 80s had been amazing, you know, I was like a small child at that time point, but uh, I would have loved to have been there, <laughs> you know? Um, and the game world, and this is like the, the really the linchpin that to me makes a, an open world game good is if the world feels like alive. Does it feel like you're in this world 
or is like the world built around you. And I have to say in Shinmu for a game that's as old as it is, the world really does feel alive. Like you meet these characters and they just kind of like roam around the town. You bump into them and see them walking around, just going about their daily business. And it, it adds a lot to the game. And you can really see how this influenced so many other games like GTA and Yakuza. Like those games were just, if this had not come out, they would not have existed. And you know, the game's still a lot of fun. I had a really good time with it. Like I said, I finished it, but it is not a perfect game. It has some flaws. Some of them are like due to the time when the game was created. And some of them are just like, I don't know, late, not laziness. Cause it's like the most expensive game ever made. Like more work went into this than any other game at the point. I guess just like an indifference to, uh, to something not being up to snuff. The big thing that drove me crazy about this was that, you know, the last third of the game, you just get like a regular job driving a flipping forklift. And I guess if you were like shut in in Japan and you were a teenager, like that to you seemed like really cool. And I've heard people say that they love it, but I am not one of them. Like I do not want to play a video game to go to work. I work every day in a real job. I have two jobs <laughs> and I really do not want to spend my time working and this game like requires you to work you have to work and you know it, it's okay but man what could have been just a side event to like raise money ended up being like I said a third of the game that was just too much the other thing that drives me crazy about this game is that you can't advance time so you spend a lot and I like I mean a lot of time uh, just like waiting around you know someone will you know, say to you like, hey, meet me at three o'clock tomorrow. And you wake up the next morning at, you know, eight or whatever it is. And you just like wander around till three o'clock. And that's annoying. That is so flipping annoying. I think like eight hours in this game is 30 minutes of real time. So if you get up like at eight in the morning and you want to meet someone in the evening, you just literally sit there for 30 minutes like hanging out, you know, just waiting, playing on your phone, like not in the game, but in real life, like waiting for time to pass. And I get that there's this side content where like you can talk to people and you can play arcade games, but you can only do that so many times. That may have seemed like a lot of content for when this game came out, but in like the modern world with Grand Theft Auto V and Yakuza and stuff, this game seems like it doesn't have much content. So I found myself like really bored uh, like early on in the game, just waiting around for people. And another thing that's annoying to go along with that is like, you can't go to bed till eight o'clock. So let's say you get up at eight in the morning, you meet someone at 10 a.m. and they're like, meet me back here tomorrow at like 9 p.m. Like you have to wait around for like 20 minutes of real life time to go to bed, to then wake up in the morning, to then just wait like another 35 minutes to, you know, get to the point where you can meet this person. And that, that's, God, that like disrespects your time. Um, and I kind of I kind of hate that. I kind of hate that. The main character, Ryo, is honestly, in my opinion, he's not much of a character. The other characters in the game are more interesting. Ryo's like, or Ryo, sorry, his his primary trait is that he's like aloof. Like people will say these really nice things to him or interesting things, and he'll just be like, okay. Like, it just he doesn't seem to have any affect. You know, he doesn't have any emotional uh, feelings whatsoever other than just, like, sometimes he gets a little angry. He also controls, like, hot garbage. Like, moving around in this game is very clunky. It's not tank controls like the old Resident Evil games. He tries to use the analog stick, but it still feels like something's off, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it, and I also kind of never really got the hang of it the whole time I played, which you can tell from a lot of this gameplay footage. It just looks like awful. <laughs> and so, you know, that, that Shinmu in a nutshell, the game ends on a cliffhanger. You have to play Shinmu too. And I'm, I'm going to get to that. It's still in the backlog, of course. Um, so what are my final thoughts on Shinmu? You know, it's just, it's a game that just kind of forces you to screw around <laughs> and that, that's fine. But like I said, there isn't much to do by today's standards. And I would describe Shimu as like moving the goalpost the game. Like you'll go to one person to like investigate a clue and they send you to the next person and then they send you to the next person and then you have to wait a day and you go to the next person and then you go to the next person and then like 
oh, you find out the thing you wanted to know about, but that's not really the case. It's actually this other thing. And then you like do it all over again. It's just like keeps getting moved back and back and back. And what feels like this investigation should have taken place like, you know, over this could have been like four little story missions in Grand Theft Auto 5 or something like that. The whole game is just that. And so eh, it's by today's standards a little hard to to stomach, but it is still a great game. It is still a real great game. It feels like Japan and the world feels alive and it's amazing. And I have to say, I would recommend it. So should you play Shinmu 1? Yeah, of course you should. Like it's a little bit of a, a struggle, but that's kind of like watching like an old, you know, movie from the 1930s where the acting seems a little off and it feels like more you're like you're watching a theater performance that was just filmed. <laughs> This is kind of like that. It, it, it is a product of its time, but it's still amazing and a lot of fun. And the story is interesting and the world's fantastic. So Shinmu 1 on the PS4, despite all its flaws, man, it's still like an 8 out of 10. It, it's great. You got to play it. Everybody should play it. It's a, it's a legend for a reason. <laughs> This next game I did not pick randomly. My daughter wanted to play this with me and it was in my backlog, so it, it made it into this video. She didn't really know what she was getting herself into. She's never played a motion controlled game before other than just dance. You know, she's like nine or about to be nine. So this one was a, a, a bit of a departure for her, but I'd never played it either, and uh, it still has the price tag on it from GameStop. It's Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz, and I paid a high price for this one. You can see right there just how sought after that game was with its price tag of $1.79. And I believe, yeah, that's the pro member price. So I got like 20 cents off of it. <laughs> so let's talk about this one. Like I said, my daughter had never played a motion control game before other than Just Dance, and I warned her I warn her guys that most gamers like hate motion controls and I do consider her like a, a pretty good gamer for a nine year old. She, she doesn't just play one game and like cell phone games. She actually plays like Super Mario Odyssey. She plays some Pokemon and some Yoshi and Animal Crossing and Kirby. You know, she has decent taste for a nine year old. Like I said, I told her most gamers hate motion controls and she just like did not believe me. She's like, no, this sounds great. And I'm like, that's what everybody said until they did it. And I have to say 20 minutes in, guys, she was absolutely crying. Like, scowled face, tears streaming down her face, and just saying like, the control is broken, it just doesn't work. And I said like, you know how we all felt now. <laughs> like, no one listened to us. We said we didn't want motion controls. And she was like, ugh. <laughs> so, I felt so bad for her. But this is just like a monkey ball game. And if you've never played Super Monkey Ball, I would have to describe it as like an ultra, ultra precision, like unforgiving physics-based platforming time trial with like a time limit. And this game is all of that, but with like Wii motion controls, <laughs> which is like pretty much my worst nightmare. <laughs> like it sounds like hell on earth to me. And it, it kind of was. <laughs> Uh, there are like a hundred or so stages in this, and there are like 50 mini games uh, that range from like Simon Says kind of stuff all the way up to like full-blown golf. It's a lot of content. Like it's a lot of content, and it's just a shame that like, how can I put this? It just doesn't flip and work. Like the game just does not work. The graphics are like cheery and colorful, just like the other games, and you know, they're, they're always like like a real joy to look at a Super Monkey Ball game. I love to look at it and watch it. And if you've never heard like the music from Super Monkey Ball, it goes really hard. Like it is, it's comically impressive for like this style of game with like a, like almost like a heavy metal soundtrack that is composed in a style that I can only describe as like a child's music box. <laughs> it's just so over the top and I love it. And uh, the presentation in this is great. Like it's the Wii, so it kind of looks a little dated, but it, it still holds up very well. You know, the, the Super Monkey Ball games are great. They are extremely challenging, and this game is like no exception. And it, it, with the motion controls, you're gonna be like pulling your hair out on some of these like simple things that you would do in like standard Monkey Ball games, like just going around a tour turn. Sorry, with the motion controls is like, you know, it like a would be a good term. It, it's a, 
it's an exercise in like futility. Like I feel like you just can't do it. I watched some speed runs of some people like beating this game and like I don't know how it's possible. I feel like they have the Wiimote or some sort of like gyroscopic actuated like platform that they're controlling with like an Xbox 360 controller. <laughs> like I don't think there's any way to do it. And you hold the controller flat like like to go forward you tilt the controller down like towards the floor which you know your wrist doesn't bend that way very well so it's just very awkward also in addition to the awful motion controls they have added like boss fights to this game and they're awful like i hate them they're really clunky they don't seem to work well and super monkey ball does not need boss fights it does not need its flow like broken up that's the thing about the game like it's designed to just be played through sequentially stage after stage after stage as you get better and better and better and like derailing yourself at the end of every world to like fight some buzzard or you know a frog or whatever have it, it's just it, it doesn't work and you know super monkey ball's already hard enough and you didn't need to add motion controls uh, you know to the game it, 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 I, don't, like, I don't know what to say anything else about it like it's playable but a normal controller is just so much more fun and the motion controls really add nothing. They just take away. So should you play Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz? <laughs> uh, no, absolutely not. Not on the Wii. I think they re-released this on the Switch and maybe the PS5, P PS4, I don't know, recently. I don't know if that has motion controls. I know the Switch kind of like does some motion control stuff, but if you can play this with a controller, that seems like the way to go. So, Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz. We did not have a good time with this around my house. Some tears were to be had, and even after my daughter like got so upset that she frustrated, I continued to play through like the single player with it, and I did not have a good time, guys. Like I just did not. Uh, I love Super Monkey Ball, but geez, this is this is rough. So, Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz on the Wii is like a four out of ten. It's pretty bad. Stay away from this one. I don't know that it's even worth the $1.78 I paid, minus tax. <laughs> All right, I say this a lot. I've got a lot of flipping Game Gear games in my backlog. I bought like a Game Gear collection from a woman and she was like close to finishing the whole set and I split it with my buddy. And so when like stuff's picked out of the backlog in my handheld category, like it seems like it's all like Switch or Game Gear. And I apologize for that. But some of you guys have mentioned that you really like Game Gear stuff. So let's dive into this one. It's a... Uh, well-known game on the Game Gear, I guess. I didn't know it was on the Game Gear before it got picked for me. I mean, I guess I knew it because I owned it, but <laughs> I wasn't thinking about it, but it's called Journey from Darkness Strider Returns. And this is Strider 2. There we go. So this is like the sequel to the f unbelievably awesome Strider arcade game. And you know, it's also on the Genesis. I actually think it's better on the Genesis than it is in the arcade. And Strider 2 is considered like pretty much by everyone or almost everyone to just be a huge disappointment. It's, it's completely inferior to the first game in like almost every way. And it was ported to nine systems. Abs like, I can't believe that. Nine systems, like the Amiga and like the ZX Spectrum, just everything out there, including the Game Gear, which you're seeing here. And the Game Gear is probably the worst despite the fact that it's almost identical to the Master System version. So, what's the story? Strider, whatever his name is, I don't know if this is Strider or some other ninja, but he's summoned to the planet Magenta <laughs> to rescue Princess Lexia, and you know, you fight aliens and cyborgs and eagles and just your average everyday ninja stuff. <laughs> just the stuff that ninjas used to run to back in the old days, you know, the aliens and the birds. <laughs> But it's just a side-scrolling action platformer, and this game, I mean, it looks fine, and the premise is whatever, but it is, it is super clunky, yet slippery controls, and I feel like they put the most intentionally annoying enemy placement and an unavoidable damage from everywhere just to like make the player upset. Just it, like this game is designed to frustrate you. And there's tons of like random leaps of faith where you have to just like jump off some rope, uh, you know, 60 feet and hope you land on a platform that you don't know is there. It, it, it's really irritating. And it has that really annoying like infuriating knockback but you also don't have very many iframes so like enemies will stun lock you you'll just get like 
knocked back and knocked here and knocked there and knocked there and it's like ragdoll physics and it, it's just bad design all around you know it, it looks decent for a, for a game gear game and everything's fairly colorful i guess and the levels are like distinctive the music is absolutely horrible <laughs> And it's not memorable at all, and it is like grating on the ears. Like it sounds really bad. But like I said, I mean the game it, it relies on its controls, and any good platformer relies on its controls. I, I, but I've never really seen any that behave quite like this. It's at times it feels like it's locked to an invisible grid system. So like you'll jump. Let's say you're like you're jumping from one platform to another, and Strider jumps over and then like as he's falling, the game without touching the controls will like auto-correct you and notch you back or forward a few pixels to snap you to the grid. And sometimes that causes you to like overshoot or undershoot what you're trying to land on. Also, when Strider's walking, he like goes at a normal pace, but when he jumps up and starts like monkey barring across the ceiling, he goes into hyperspeed. <laughs> And he like runs off the end and it's maddening. I hate it. The opening area of the game took me like 10 minutes to get through it. Cause like I just, you're just jumping from branch to branch. I couldn't even get it to work. So this game's bad guys. I didn't finish it. It, it is painfully miserable to play. And I wanted to pull my hair out and throw the game gear across the room and having to play it again on an emulator to capture this gameplay footage for you guys, because I don't have any way to like record my Game Gear other than pointing the camera at the screen. <laughs> uh, playing this again on the emulator was like torture. I was so unhappy with it. I really did not like it. Of course I didn't beat it, like I said. I, I made it, I think there are five stages and I barely made it to the beginning of stage four on my game gear i couldn't even get remotely that close on the on the on the emulator it's harder to play on the emulator and you know that was enough for me so is journey to darkness journey from darkness strider returns on the game gear something you want to play absolutely not i think this is the lowest reviewed game i've ever done on this channel and it is rare for a game to get a score of this but this is a two out of 10. This is painfully miserable. It like games in my mind that I hate. And I'm like, these are some of the worst games of all time. This is like usurped them. <laughs> like this is jumped ahead of them in terribleness. This is an awful, awful, awful game. And no one should ever play this on the Game Gear at all. <laughs> two out of 10, miserable. All right, we've had two terrible games in a row. Let's have a good game. <laughs> I played this game, uh, the, the original game, uh, years ago and loved it. They, the company that put it out, Yacht Club Games, has done like DLCs and expansions to it, and they they could put them all in a compilation. It's Shovel Knight Treasure Trove, and the game I played off of this, I didn't play the whole thing, was the Shovel Knight Specter of Torment. That's it, Specter of Torment. You play the Specter Knight, and they list on the back like all the things included. So the middle one's the one I played. Um, but this is a like a free DLC. If you own the original Shovel Knight, like on the PS4 or whatever, just the base game, I think you have access to this and can download it for free, which is amazing. I'm so happy it's included on the cart with the treasure trove. So this is like the prequel to Shovel Knight and it tells how all the bosses from the first game like kind of came to know each other um, and how Donovan, who is the Spectre Knight, uh, came to be. If you've never played Shovel Knight before, it's like an 8-bit style side-scrolling action game. And I have to say, the gameplay in this is like pretty much perfect. It's exactly what you would want. It, it's based off like Mega Man. And the stages are like, you know, fast and full of cool things that happen and interesting ideas. And Spectre Knight controls great. He has a wall climb ability uh, and an air dash attack that makes like traversing the levels like like a joy like it's really fun you unlock sub weapons from defeating uh or you you, you unlock sub weapons from like beating the levels and they, they help you like succeed like i said like mega man it's that same sort of deal and the game looks unbelievable it, it's got this like like i said beautiful 8-bit styling but the music is fantastic it's like a like a baroque style 
chiptune <laughs> theme and it's at times like breathtaking i absolutely loved it and overall the game's art style and general aesthetic are just unbelievable and, and, and some of the best i've ever seen in like any retro modern uh kind of game in this genre i i, I don't really <laughs> This is, this is one of the granddaddies of all of them, right? Of this like retro 8-bit throwback revolution we've had recently, and it, that's for a reason. One of the things I love about like the Shovel Knight games is the checkpoint system. I love that it's like challenging and difficult, but the, the abundant checkpoint points throughout the levels, there's like five, six or so, uh, they keep the game from getting too frustrating or stressful. Like if you die and you have to do the same section over and over again, you don't have to start the game from the beginning like we did when we were kids or from the beginning of the stage. You just lose like, 30 seconds of progress and most of the areas you're going to get through on your first try anyway. On the downside of this one in particular, the Specter of Torment, I feel like Specter Knight's kind of OP. He's like a little overpowered and all of the bosses felt really easy. Uh, I like, I think I only had to replay maybe two bosses in the whole game and all the others I just like beat on my first try and I felt like I was just spamming dash attacks on them. Like he locks on to enemies and just dashes towards them and you can chain that together. And some of the, the enemies have like a pattern where they'll block that or they become invulnerable for a minute. But when you do that, you just kind of like hop around or wall climb or whatever to get away from the, the, the projectiles that they're shooting at you. So, uh, I, uh, I felt like that brought the game down a little bit. I would have liked a little bit more challenge to the bosses and maybe boss patterns that were more suited to Specter Knight's abilities, right? Like, it felt like, I said, he was OP and the game wasn't really designed about that, around that. It, it feels like he was kind of shoved into the original Shovel Knight. But in general, the whole Shovel Knight presentation is one of the best, like, I've ever seen for a retro style game. And it's like, DLC package, that's what I'm gonna call it, is, is no different. It, it adds to the already amazing Shovel Knight universe and you know it has top-notch gameplay and graphics and music and even like a touching story. Like I thought the story was really good in this. It's certainly one of the better 8-bit stories you're ever gonna see. Um, so like I said, it's challenging, but it's fair with its checkpoints and it doesn't overstay its welcome and it doesn't really do anything new, but it, it doesn't need to as well. I beat Specter of Torment on here. I did it in like two sittings. I thought it was really good and I enjoyed it a lot. I look forward to playing the other games on this compilation, but Shovel Knight Specter of Torment is great. It's like an eight out of 10. I would highly recommend it, but I would play Shovel Knight proper first, <laughs> the original game first, so you have a better appreciation of it. All right, we're back with the game that I talk about in every freaking video. <laughs> like I said, I, I bought these games on the Switch. They're shoot 'em ups from the company Psycho. They don't work on the Switch. I played through like, I don't know, five or six of them or something like that. And then, because there were, a, a PS4 version was predicted to come out. Uh, when I played them and they were so buggy, I didn't cross them off the backlog. I just sort of like pushed them to the side till the PS4 version came out. And thankfully the PS4 version is much better and the games work. You can actually like beat them now. <laughs> and so I, uh, I've been playing through those, and this was the last ones. So there are no more of these in this like secondary backlog. Like I'm back to just the normal backlog, guys. Finally, <laughs> it took a while to play through these. This one's really good. It's the best of all the Psycho games I've covered on my channel thus far, and it's on the Psycho Shooting Library Volume One, and it's Strikers 1945 Two. We covered Strikers 1945 One last time. Let's talk about this. So I did one credit clear this on the Switch. Uh, it, it was playable on the Switch. It was one of the better games on the Switch version, but it was just like I one credit cleared it on like the easier difficulties and I was trying to like build up my skill and work my way up to the, the higher ones and it was just too laggy to do that. So I, I knew this one would go by pretty quickly on the PS4 because I had already like learned how to play the game more or less. Uh, I just needed to to hone my skills, so to speak. Like I said, this one's better on the PS4, and it, it, it's the sequel to Strikers 1945, and it, it's in this alternate World War II setting with like tanks and battleships and, you know, robots and mechs and giant crabs and all the other normal stuff that the soldiers encountered in World War II. <laughs> all the stuff we learned about in history class, the giant flying crabs, you know, <laughs> the downfall <laughs> of the, the Allies. Anyway. It's the same gameplay as the other Psycho games. I've been over this a lot of times. You know, the first 
four of the eight stages are all randomized. So you play them in any order, not in any order, that it assigns it to you. And you hope you get like a good pattern. Um, and in this time, the you have a, a charge attack that charges up really quickly, but you have to like level it up by killing enemies. So typically, you save your charge attack till the boss, which is adds to the gameplay from the first Strikers game where you're trying to like use the, the charge attack as often as you can. Um, the ships in this are all like great. They're all very feasible. I mean, there are some that are better than the others, <laughs> like the Hayate, which has like heat seeking little planes that help you out. Um, but they all have like really cool designs and they're very varied in the way they work with their shot and their speeds and the way their bombs work. And this game, miraculously, unlike the other Psycho games, your power-ups don't wear off over time, as far as I can tell. So once you stay powered up, you stay powered up, which I love. It lets you focus on the gameplay rather than like chasing power-ups the whole time, trying to, to not become like super weak and unable to beat a boss. The graphics, you know, they look about the same as the first game, uh, which is cool. It's got like that World War II gritty look to it, but I, I like the way this looks. There are many shmups that are in this style, you know, and <laughs> I, I think this, this pulls it off pretty well. But I will say this, the music in this game is greatly improved, like really improved over the other Psycho games I've covered thus far and way improved over Psycho's uh, Strikers 1945 Part 1. Uh, it really rocks this time, and there are a couple really good tracks that are very catchy, which is uncommon for these Psycho games, so that was a, a very uh, welcome change. Th I mean, this game like improves over the other ones. You know, the stages are more well thought out, and the, the Psycho random level system works well in this game. Their whole gameplay style just it, 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 it kind of came into its own during this game, I would say. And I love how short and compact the stages are. You can blow through the whole game in like 20 or 30 minutes, and that, that helps a lot. But, but like all the other games on this compilation, it's, it's not perfect. I mean, the arcade game's great, but in modern compilations, we're expecting extras, and this game has no save states. It has no training modes as usual. You know, you, you jump in, and if you want to work on that last boss, you've got to play all the way through the game to have a shot at it. And in Psycho games, when you get to the last four stages, if you die or have to continue, you go back to the beginning of the stage. It's not like you don't respawn where you died. So like practicing a boss is a real chore. Uh, and with all these games, the same thing happens. Like you become a master at like 98% of the game. And then that last 2% will just waste you. You'll lose all your lives. And like you have to play through the whole flipping game again. So it forces you to almost like practice on an emulator, which I hate to say that, and then like come to your PS4 version to, to, to you know, unlock the achieve or trophies or what are you, or actually beat it on the system, you know, to get on the leaderboards. But there are no leaderboards on this, so it doesn't even matter anyway. Um, so this one, I've mentioned that the Psycho games on this compilation, the difficulty levels, of which there are seven in every game, they go from monkey all the way up to like super hard. Uh, the difficulty levels in this are like evenly paced, but they're they're still huge jumps. The difficulty level of this one over Strikers 1945-1 is greatly uh, increased, like it's much harder. But like bumping it up to the next difficulty, like two out of seven, was way harder, like so much harder. It didn't even feel like it was twice as tough. It felt like it was maybe four times as tough. And then I was able to one credit clear that after some practice, and then bumping it up to the next one was like, you know, Half again is hard. It, it, it's just a huge ramp up. And without those save states, without some sort of training mode, this is a tall order for somebody that isn't just already like an expert at this. Because back in the day, you know, you go to the arcade and you would just pump quarters into the machine like and spend $5,000 mastering a game. Like that, that, that's falling to the wayside, guys. We don't need to do that. Any developers out here, if you're going to bring an arcade game over to a modern console, don't make us like play through the game over and over and over again like we're pumping in quarters in the old day. You've already got our money. <laughs> like you already had it. Just give us some save states and give us some like training modes or something so we can practice like that one mid boss that keeps taking all our lives without having to play the same crap that we've done over and over and over again. So after that mini rant, <laughs> you know, Strikers 1945-2 is considered by many to be one of the best, if not like the best Psycho shooting game. And I would have to agree. This game is, it's still featured on like the Shmups Forum best Shmups of all time list and it's updated every year and it has stayed on there for like 
like a decade and a half or something like that. So people love this game. I do think it's really great. And I just wish it was in a better package, you know, with safe states and stuff that we're expecting. So Strikers 1945-2, very good shoot 'em up. I wish it had, like I said, some training modes or something like that, but still great, still fun to play. And it plays well on the PS4. Strikers 1945-2 is an eight out of 10. Congratulations, Psycho, you did it. You got an eight out of 10 game. Now, I do believe I gave Strikers 1945 one an eight out of 10 as well. This is better than that one. I would say that one's like an 8.0. This is like an 8.5. It's slightly better, but not quite good enough to get up into that like amazing nine out of 10 level. <laughs> not quite yet. It's like A tier, not S tier. Maybe B tier, I'm not sure, <laughs> but still great. We have another Game Gear game here. I played it right after that last one. And this is a like a beloved game on the Sega Genesis. It's probably like one of the best games on the Sega Genesis. I haven't played it there in a long time. I kind of forgot it was on the Game Gear, but I gave it a shot. And it's Streets of Rage 2. Bet you didn't know that was on the Game Gear, huh? <laughs> Like I said, this is the Game Gear port of the beloved Genesis beat em up series. And uh, many people, I think maybe even myself included, consider Streets of Rage to be like one of the best beat em up franchises of all time. And, you know, the first Game Gear port of Streets of Rage, or the, the, the Game Gear port of the first Streets of Rage, I've never played it, but I've heard from people that it's like unplayable and just absolutely miserable. And that this one, thankfully, is, is, is supposed to be a much better. So the story, you know, after the events of the first game, Mr. X is back and he's kidnapped your buddy this time and you have to, you know, smash your way through tons of street punks and <laughs> other rabble rousers to get him back. You have three characters to choose from, you know, with their different strengths and weaknesses, which is the standard for the, the Streets of Rage game. Their Axel and Blaze are back, uh, which is nice. Um, but since this is on like the Game Gear, you know, there's only like two buttons instead of the three you have on the Genesis. So the gameplay has been like adapted somewhat. Um, you still have most of the special moves, which is nice. And you kind of perform those via like street fighter inputs, like quarter circle forward, you know, punch or like forward forward B or whatever. Um, and it, it works pretty well here, but it can be a little tricky to pull it off. I will say this, it was very tricky to pull it off on the emulator footage you're seeing here. I had to go back and play it again, of course, to capture gameplay footage, because there's no way to record it from my game gear. Um, so it, I'm playing really poorly here. <laughs> I don't like playing on emulators. I feel like there's input delay or something weird with my setup, but ignore that, guys. I promised I played it a lot better. I beat it on the game gear, so anyway. The game graphically does look really good. It's colorful and it, it really tries to give the feel of like the Genesis game. It's an 8-bit system as opposed to like a 16-bit system. So of course there's going to be some like concessions here and there where you can't really pull it off. But I think they pulled it off pretty well, you know. Uh, the music's done by, uh, what's his name, Yuzo Koshiro, like famous, <laughs> famous 16-bit composer. And, uh, you know, he's back in this version and he does like a pretty good, it's pretty good like 8-bit renditions of the 16-bit games. Although sometimes they get like a little weird with like these screeching sounds at certain points. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it gets a little out there. And I have to say the music in this and these 8-bit renditions are some of the best I've ever heard on the Game Gear. I've only played like, I don't know. You've seen every Game Gear game I've ever played on this channel, guys. <laughs> every one of them has been covered thus far. So I think this is the best music out of all of those. And the game does play pretty well. You know, it, it's a really good handheld port. There are only five, I think, of the original eight stages, which is kind of a blessing because this game can get, and like a lot of beat-em-ups, it can get really tedious. And I start finding myself kind of like zoning out halfway through. And that, that is the case here, but that, that's not this game's fault. That's just the fault of like the, the style of game. It's a lot more fun when you play with somebody else, but there's no way to play with anybody else in the game gear. It's fully a, a solo experience. Some things I really hate about the game though, is that like the enemies, they flip and read your inputs and they react faster than you. So what you'll do, like, let's say you do like a jump kick, you'll like jump kick while an enemy's standing still, then while you're mid-air, unable to control yourself, the enemy will like 
punch you out of the air and there's nothing you can do to avoid that damage and it leads to tons of cheap damage in this game i felt like i was able to kind of like cheese it on the game gear myself but the on the emulator i was having a hard time just with the controls and i wasn't able to do nearly as well also the enemies and you can see that here they will just stun lock the crap out of you <laughs> you just keep getting like mercilessly knocked down over and over and over and they'll like blow through your entire health bar and kill you and then blow through your health bar the next health bar and kill you and you'll lose like three lives you know in eight seconds from some boss just like cheaply hitting you over and over again but but that being said i do think this is like a fateful rendition of the original streets of rage 2 on the genesis it's not as good at all it doesn't look as good it doesn't sound as good it's a little clunkier it's missing two player of course so if you're gonna play streets of rage 2 you're gonna want to like play it on the genesis <laughs> unless of course you know you like travel back to 1993 and you have no other option <laughs> like which is why this game exists right people had to play it on their handheld system they had, they had no other option but there are many more options now guys so i'm noticing now that it says two player on the cart for this it says one or two player i don't know how that works on the game gear like do you could you link the game gear systems together i don't think so could you or did you like you take turns or something i, I don't know let me know about that i'm confused about that because I didn't see any like two-player options at all when I was playing it. But let me know. Anyway, should you play Streets of Rage 2 on the Game Gear? Probably not. It's fine. It's a 7 out of 10 for a Game Gear game, or just a game in general. But I beat it. I had a good time with it. It's hard. I played it on easy. There's like easy and hard difficulty. So I guess I took easy as like normal. Anyway, uh, it's a 7 out of 10. But play it on the Genesis if you're going to play it. <laughs> it's, not, it's not worth putting your time in here, I don't think, when that other version exists. All right, guys, those of you that are still with me, are you still here? You're still here with me? Come here. I have a secret for you. This is the special treat. We've done it, guys. We've done it. Humanity has created the greatest game of all time. I don't know why it took us this long, but we, we finally did it collectively. I played it. I beat it. I had a good time with it. I don't know how I'm going to show it on YouTube, but let's do it anyway. This is... <laughs> Waifu Discovered Medieval Fantasy 2 <laughs> from Funbox Media. The greatest masterpiece ever created, obviously. So, uh, I, man, I don't even know what to say about this. This is like a hentai shoot 'em up game. I do not even know how this got a physical release on the Switch. It blows my mind. It's it's done by One Hand Studios, uh, wink, wink. And uh, it's the sequel to Waifu Uncovered. And I, I, like I said, I'm just shocked because this game, guys, it has like full frontal nudity in it. <laughs> I don't know how I'm gonna show this in the gameplay footage. Maybe it'll be heavily edited, but you can see from the, the graphics and what you're seeing on the screen, just like what this game is. Uh, <laughs> The premise is as far-fetched and shallow as it is, is that like these fantasy girls have demons in their clothes and you have to blast the clothes off of them to save them. Of course, I mean, obviously, like you'd come to that conclusion just walking down the street, right? <laughs> so it's a one screen shoot 'em up kind of like Galaga where the enemies are all kind of at the top and they cascade around and you just move from left to right and up and down, but you're not like scrolling upwards or downwards and you have these cute girls in the background and as you kill enemies they drop these crystals that you collect and those crystals like go into the girls clothes to destroy them uh and you also while you're playing you gather money that you use to like purchase upgrades between the rounds and as you beat the stage it like it gives you unlocks when you reach enough the next time you play it it uh uncensors more and more and more of the girls in the background and you can see where that's going. So it gets a little grindy, but I actually kind of liked the grind. I kind of like unlockables and shmups, so I didn't mind it that much. And you know, you're working towards what you're working towards. So it's like, that's a big motivator for you. Like, I mean, for some people, I don't know of any other bigger motivator than this. So I'm sure some people put some time into this. Um, as for like the presentation, you know, the girls are, uh, they're, they're drawn well <laughs> and, the music's really fun and catchy. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, 
And I like that the gameplay is like kind of hectic. It's never boring. I was never bored for a second with this game. And like I said, there's lots of things to unlock, which I really enjoyed. Uh, but there's some like weird unlockables and upgrades and things you need to do in this game that are kind of like esoteric. And there are tricks like you have to steal from the shopkeeper by like knocking a lamp off a, 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 a holder. And when she's not looking, you like, you know, grab a power up. Like there's no way to know that without like looking online. And I saw that there were some like, there are tr like trophies or achievements in the game. And uh, it gives you hints, but like, like me and everybody else out there, I had to go online to figure out what they were talking about. Uh, and you know, getting extra lives and things like that, it's really esoteric and you kind of need a little bit of a guide to figure it out. However, once I got the guide, I was able to like unlock everything, you know, in a, a couple of sittings. So it wasn't so bad, <laughs> but this game, you know, as lewd as it is and just like bonkers that it even exists in the first place, it was really fun. And I found it to be really addictive and had a really interesting gameplay loop. And it, you know, it's designed with a, uh, a certain audience in mind <laughs> but it actually has some decent gameplay to back it up which was nice a lot of these games are just like mahjong it's just mindless stuff with cute girls and they're just relying on the cute girls this game's has good gameplay but it's hoping the cute girl thing like gives it a big boost and i think it probably did i'm sure it did you know uh and i think this game's elevated to something a little bit more than a hentai game so there you go. <laughs> but I hope I hope YouTube doesn't ban me forever for showing this. So I completed this game. I not to toot my own horn. I'm pretty good at shmups, and like I beat it on like easy my first try, and then like normal on my second try, and then like hard on my third try, and then like expert on my fourth try, like no problem. Only dying like a couple times, and you can like buy extra lives to your coin. So it's a fairly easy experience, but it was really fun and engaging and unlocking stuff like the other ships and your power ups and stuff was a blast. I really enjoyed it. The cute girls. I mean, that wasn't my motivation in this game at all, but like it doesn't hurt like and I'm sure it's going to help other people that want to get this game, give them the motivation to play through it. So I can't believe I'm saying this. But Waifu Discovered 2, for the amount of fun I had with it and the enjoyment I had, it was like an 8 out of 10. It's a bad game. Like everything on paper is a bad game when you think about this, but it just kind of worked. I I'm really surprised. So if you're an adult and you like cute anime girls and you like shoot them ups, I would like recommend this. I can't believe I'm flipping saying this. Like I can't believe I'm saying this. This is a fun game. I enjoyed it. Like if it didn't have the cute girls at all and the backgrounds were just like you were scrolling over forests or deserts or lavas or some lava fields, I would still play it and still just have just as much fun. So I don't know. Funbox Media and One Hand Studios like you can do other stuff, guys. You don't have to do this to just like stand out. I'll show you the back of the box. You made it this far. There you go. All right, and there are also in this package included postcards of like the girls and scantily clad or not clad at all. <laughs> all right, guys, there's seven more games out of my backlog. Six were picked randomly. My daughter picked one of them. So glad you stuck around this far. Hope you liked the special treat. Like I said, greatest game ever made, right? How could we ever improve? <laughs> so thanks so much for all your support. If you haven't and you like the content, like the video, please subscribe. We're working our way up to a thousand subscribers. I'd love to get there. Hit the bell notification if you want to know when the videos come out. They come out every Saturday morning. So enjoy that. It's like Saturday morning cartoon style, except, you know, not good. <laughs> But thanks so much, guys, and I'll catch you next time.